I have the great pleasure of having Robert Hill in the class with us. Um, Robert is currently Chancellor of the University of Adelaide. He is Chairman of the Australian Carbon Trust. And he's also Adjunct Professor in Sustainability at the US Study Center, where he's leading a whole bunch of interesting programs with uh, important partners. So we have a soil carbon project with the University of Sydney. We have a comparative water project with Stanford University in California. Uh, I want to thank Robert for doing all of that for us. Of course, Robert came to the US Study Center from a, a full life lived in politics. Uh, he was an Australian senator representing his native uh, South Australia for 25 years. Uh, in the past 15 years, he has held the following three positions for the Australian government. First, he was Australian Environment Minister from 1996 to 2001 during which time he led Australia's involvement in the negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, from 2001 to 2006, he was Defence Minister in the Australian Government, uh, heading Australia's involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. And from 2006 until 2009, he was Australian Ambassador at the United Nations in New York, leading Australia's bid to become a member of the Security Council. Um, those were all pretty big jobs. So it was certainly a, 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 real, a, a real benefit to uh, the United States Study Centre and the Sydney University that Robert agreed in 2009 to come and work with us. Um, there is no doubt that Robert is one of not only Australia's, but the world's most experienced and knowledgeable people about climate change. He's also got this uh, irritatingly Australian self-effacing model that, that, that means that I'm not allowed to say anything nice about him for more than five seconds. So I'll just drag this out for as long as it's humanly possible. Um, what I, what I, you know, that in the world of American hyperbole, everyone is the world's greatest expert on everything. In this case, it happens to be true that Robert knows more about climate change policy in Australia, in the US, and the world than almost anybody. So it is uh, an enormous uh, pleasure to have him here today. Robert, thanks for joining us. case with uh, government officials or former government officials, uh, the rules of the game today are that I and we can ask Robert any question we want, uh, but he's free to answer those questions in any way he wants. Um, so let me start, Robert, at the top uh, with what I think for Australian students is probably uh, a really important perspective point, which is the differences between the national psyches regarding climate change in Australia and the US. And let me, let me just um, prompt that with my personal, a little bit of personal biography for me. When I returned to Australia in the middle of 2008, it was when the Garno report was out. And I was just struck by the almost religious fervor with which Australians seem to care about climate change. It didn't matter whether Australia was acting alone or internationally. There was just a, well, it was the greatest moral challenge of our time and the country seemed to be gripped by it. I just left the United States where climate change seemed to be a secondary issue. Yes, we care about carbon, uh, carbon emissions, but we care about them mostly because of energy security. America's been dependent on Middle East oil too long. Sure, we've got to deal with climate change, but energy security is more important. Do you think that's a fair characterization of the fundamental, are there fundamental differences between the way Australians and Americans think about climate change? Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. It was all true, by the way. Uh, no, I don't think there are fundamental differences. So, uh, particularly if you, uh, depends who you're talking to, if you're talking to the young generation in the US and Australia, I think their views are fairly similar. This is a serious issue and uh, we should be making an effort, we Australians should be making an effort, we in the United States should be making an effort 
is true that uh, uh, from a public policy perspective in the US energy security is a bigger issue than it is in Australia. There's quite a bit of energy in Australia and quite a lot of coal. And, uh, uh, but they think of it in terms of uh, strategic security more than we do, so a bit of great focus on oil because you need oil to run the machines of war. But I don't think that's uh, that's really the, the, your, your, front, your, your, your starting point that, uh, that there's a fundamental difference between this kind of agree with that. Okay, possible. good. So then let's go back to Kyoto, negotiating code Kyoto. So you were involved in that process, leading the Australian team. Um, I want to ask you, uh, just to remind us all, what was so important about the Kyoto Protocol, it's now ancient history 10 years ago, uh, and then I want to ask you a, a question about, you, you said that the US and Australia had similar views on climate change as countries. Uh, Australia and the US stood out in the early 2000s as the two developed countries that didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So I was wondering why the Howard government did it, did not ratify, and how important the, the apparent implausibility of the Senate, the US Senate's ratifying Kyoto was to Australia's decision. So two parts. Why was the Kyoto Protocol so important? And if it was so important, why did neither Australia nor the US ratify it? Um, well, there were a number of questions, questions there, I guess. Um, uh, both, well, both Australia and the US recognise the economic significance of, of the Kyoto Protocol. The Framework Convention on Climate Change in 92 basically uh, set some aspirational goals and talked about accounting and, and so forth, but didn't provide any, any uh, legal obligations on any party, so no one had to take any any specific economic sacrifice in terms of the framework. So, so the beginning, just to get everybody on the same page, the beginning is Rio 1992? We can go back a bit before that. I, I guess for a few decades before, there was a, a growing concern about human-induced climate change. And that led to setting up of the International Panel on Climate Change. By, by the United Nations? Uh, no. Uh, by the, um, what was I sharing? the uh, uh, World Meteorological Bureau and UNEP, which is, which is a United Nations uh, institution. Uh, and that fed, fed the debate in a few years before 92. The convention was negotiated over only about 18 months pre-1992. So there was, there was almost global consensus that this was an issue that needed to be addressed. And because the, the framework convention is not threatening in itself in terms of economic cost, uh, it was um, it received very wide. Okay, so Rio, Rio said Rio then. Yeah. So the negotiations finished just before the Rio conference. So Rio, in effect, adopted the, uh, the convention, uh, and um, within uh, within two years it had come in. To effect, including being passed overwhelmingly by the US Senate. Okay, so it said climate change is a real issue and we, the world, need to reduce our carbon emissions. We have, but we no. have to avoid damage as a result of human behaviour. Okay. But then the concept under, uh, under the Framework Convention was that there would be protocols that would place real, uh, real costs on parties. They had to actually achieve reductions, and everybody knew that would be everything. Cost, therefore, it's uh, what like rubber hits the road, as they say. So that that really came a couple of years later. The, the convention came into being for operation in 1994, and the first conference of the parties uh, was the following year, 1995, in Berlin, uh, and that was the negotiation that was basically who was going to accept this this legally binding burden. Uh, and it was decided in that negotiation that the developed world would be the party that accepted a burden and there would be a negotiation of, the, of that deal and that would be implemented through a protocol that would be agreed.
two years later. Yeah. Okay, so then you were in government and now you've got to negotiate this deal. Yeah. How did that go? So I got in, when I came in into the portfolio in 2006, there was a raging debate taking place across the world. 1996. Sorry, what did I say? 2006. 19, these decades. Well, I'm, 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 I'm getting on. You're very direct. So 1996. Um, there was a raging debate going on around the world in this field on you know, what would be what would be the burden, what, what would be the, the price that countries would pay, whether you would be allowed to have flexibility mechanisms to reduce those costs uh, and so forth. And that was all part of negotiating what was to become the Kyoto Protocol. But both the United States and Australia were very focused on the economic cost. But this was Al Gore's US. Well, I was going to say, I was about to say to you, the Senate may have reflected a slightly different America than Al Gore, really Clinton's Gore was just doing business with Clinton, than what uh, the Clinton's America. Because the Senate already at that time was, was saying, yes, we should be doing something, but we don't want to sacrifice American funds, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And that same view was being held in Australia. But what was happening were the developed countries were basically doing, doing the sums on what a, a certain commitment would mean in terms of their economic, economic cost. But the Europeans, in the Kyoto negotiations, the Europeans seem more accepting of embracing real costs on the European economy than was the case either for Australia or the US. Was that, or was that that's the after-the-fact rendering of this. Was that true in the negotiations, or was there really a you know, more, more broad-based consensus about what needed to be done? Well, that was the, that was the European spin, that basically they would accept more. Uh, but everyone knew that nobody would agree. No one had to agree on anything, really. So what you're prepared to agree, and nobody was prepared to agree any more than anybody else when it comes to the crunch. So, so an equivalence of effort was what was trying, what was being the attempt was to determine an equivalent an equivalence of effort to very different economies. That was the complexity of the negotiation. Okay, the so European yeah. spin was we would accept more, and on the face of it, you could say it seemed that they were prepared to accept more. But under the rules, they were given special advantages. They were allowed to negotiate as a block. Uh, and they were allowed to mix and match between the countries of Europe to achieve a European target. Right, because the EU is a negotiating party in international agreements, so they can have a special status yeah. in this agreement. So the US, for example, didn't have that same privilege. Yeah. If you say roughly the US economy privilege the whole of the Europe economy, mm -hmm. the Europeans uh, had a negotiating advantage. So in a country in Europe where the cost of the was lower, they, in their own internal calculations, would be prepared to take a higher uh, mm -hmm. cost in that country and offset it against another country where the cost of the bank. Okay, so this is a, this is way on the inside. What was the? I, remind us what the headline what was meant to Kyoto was. Kyoto you know, was supposed to be minus five percent uh, off of uh, nineteen ninety levels, nineteen ninety levels uh, to be achieved in this. Uh, Current accounting period, which expires in 2012. Okay, so over over current uh, account between 2008 and 2012. Okay, um, so it was supposed to lead to a significant reduction of emissions. And remember that at this time, the world's changed very rapidly in the last 10 years. But at that time, people were still still believed that the major emitters were all going to be from. Okay, so let's leave China aside for a second. The two, two questions about Kyoto now, very specifically. One, uh, the Europeans say they've met their Kyoto targets. Have they, and have Australia and the US, even though Australia only ratified under Rudd, and the US still hasn't ratified? What, how effective has Kyoto been? Um, well, all of this could have been done, whatever the outcomes have been, they could have been done without Kyoto. To what has been the how have countries gone in meeting the targets mm -hmm. of Kyoto? Uh, Europe, I think, is basically 
Go for that. That is yeah. that. But I think basically in Europe is They certainly on, say they've done it. I think they're pretty much on target um, uh, with the advantages that they've got. And they introduced an emissions trading scheme to help them achieve it. So basically, they did put a cap on it. And then they were able to mix and match under their cap to achieve it. Uh, Australia is basically on target to meet its PAD uh, obligation. Uh, Australia was given that particular clause that others didn't have the benefit of, which uh, don't talk about that. Uh, and the US is not on target to, nowhere near on target to meet its, and others like Canada are on way on Okay, so Australia is on target, the US isn't, but the Howard, neither the Howard government nor the Bush government pushed for ratification of Kyoto, a deal that you negotiated, and I presume you were quite comfortable with the deal you got for Australia. Why did neither government want to ratify this deal? Well, Howard, the distinction is that Howard said from the start that, that Australia was committed to meet its time for the ratifying time. Mm -hmm. So, and when uh, Mr. Rudd became Prime Minister and went off to Bali and was a global hero and said we ratified we're actually on target to meet our Kyoto commitment. So uh, it was pretty good with politics because the visual out there was that by going to Bali and saying we would ratified that we were doing something mm -hmm. extra in substance. So that's a bit perplexing. Yeah. Australia's doing it de facto but not taking the credit by not ratifying and in fact taking a bunch of heat. So what was the thinking in the government that led to that? Well, the, the real thinking was, um, it gets back to the United States, because the US was the world's largest economy and it was also the world's largest emitter. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about what is an effective response to climate change, you can't have an effective response without the United States. Although I said that in 2008 in Australia and I got dumped on like a ton of bricks for either being pro-American or being, uh, you know, uh, merely now, because of course Australia should do the right thing, even if it's only 1% of global emissions or whatever it is, we should do the right thing anyway. Who cares what the US does? Oh, well, I'm not opposed to leadership, but no one lead, then you don't get an outcome. Uh, but what I was, that's a different question to what I set myself an answer, which is you don't get an effective global response without the United States. Okay. So our approach was that we wanted to, um, we wanted to keep the US in the tent, we didn't want to isolate. And the problem was that uh, uh, the US accepted a, a very demanding target in Kyoto. Gore, you mentioned, went along to a Kyoto meeting. And hey, he won him a Nobel Peace Prize. Well, uh, his subsequent events won him a Nobel Peace Prize, but he, on the same subject, but he went along for Clinton and up the, as I recall correctly, up the US uh, target by 2% of the amount that everybody else do like. And almost everybody did, except Australia. But then, uh, but then they didn't ratify, and the US didn't ratify. And their argument against not ratifying was, was really in the flexibility mechanism. So one thing is to set the target. But when we set the targets in Kyoto, rules under which those targets would be met, but how you calculate your commitment weren't settled. They were to be settled in subsequent meetings. And the US had in mind certain uh, rules that related to international offsets uh, to achieve their targets. So and there's nothing wrong with that conceptually, because if the offsets are cheaper in Latin America, you actually get more carbon saving for the same amount of money. But Larry Summers, I remember at the time, got in trouble for saying he wanted to export pollution to the developing world. Well, um, that's, uh, yeah, but again, what, this, is, this is a global issue. It doesn't really matter whether the carbon is produced here or the carbon is produced mm -hmm. in China. We all suffer the consequence. And where the cost of abatement was lower, for the same amount of money, you should be able should to save a lot more carbon. Mm -hmm. So, but the Europeans hated that. They, the Europeans were of a view uh, that you had to, that this wouldn't work globally unless the major emitters actually took their responsibility up front and addressed it domestically, domestic policies. So, when two years later in The Hague, what year are we up to now? Kyoto was 1997, The Hague was 19. 
called Great Lynn. Um, it kept, we got to the crash point. Um, the US, and this was right at the end of uh, Clinton, in fact, they they'd lost the election. So it must have been 2000, then. Late 2000, yeah, sorry. Correct. It was 2000, late 2000. They lost the election, but they were still in office. Mm -hmm. uh, it was November 2000. And he was very busy at that time, Mr. Clinton. There was a last, there was a last chance whereby the Clintons could say, we will present to the Senate. They wouldn't have time to do it, but they would have accepted the detail of the deal of Kyoto. So it took the three years to negotiate the, the flexibility mechanisms, and in actual fact they weren't completed. So, so Bali, the Bali, the big thing about the Bali meeting 
was that they adopted a process to try to negotiate a formula to provide for a global response. So that's 2007, and the global response was supposed to be going to be agreed to the meeting in Copenhagen two years later. Two but years it is relevant to Yeah, but that was Kevin Rudd at yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that was, he was irrelevant to it. Okay, don't quote so me on this, or Robert. Kevin Rudd was irrelevant. He was totally relevant to there being a bar in that day. But he was the process that had started two years before, it was endorsed in Bali, okay. and then it was negotiated yes. for the following two years, which led to Copenhagen. So after Bali, you had two negotiating tracks. One was what would be the next set of commitments on developed countries post Kyoto, uh -huh. and what would be the long term cooperative plan to bring the whole of the world in. Now that was necessary, not only because um, you needed that for a global solution, but in terms of US domestic politics, mm -hmm. the administration would have to be able to go to the, to, the, to, the, to the legislature, to the Senate in particular, and say China is going to pull its weight because of the economic consequences of one party taking a legally binding burden and the other party not. In the meantime, the trade relationship between the US and China had become so vital that the Congress was focused on anything that would give the base or China a free kick. So that's that's so you were you're taking the next logical step of trying to find a global answer, but you're also in doing that trying to address the maintaining as domestic as possible. Okay. Now that was also an issue in Australia. You've heard about the arguments about leakage, we can't afford to take leakage. This is the argument again. Uh, uh, taking a lead, that we are a major natural resource country, why should we be taking mm -hmm. a lead? What's the advantage if the plant that processes copper moves from Australia to Indonesia that doesn't have a legally binding car? It, it means that you suffer economically on the planet, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. for no better off. Yes. So that was the lead up to, to Copenhagen. But in the meantime, uh, the developed countries, and to some extent the developing countries, but nevertheless, looking at what domestic policies they needed mm -hmm. to achieve either slow, a slowing of growth of carbon or a reduction of growth. And Australia started looking at a cap and trade in about 1999. Because uh, I remember the minister who started that who process. Was that minister? Oh, I don't think can't remember his name. But, um, and, but it, and it was far too early. It was just too hard. But it, started to get a process developed. Unfortunately, it then got lost when Howard decided not to ratify Kyoto. The processes that were in place to achieve greater saving, emission saving, also were put to one side. But in the lead up to the 2000 election, 2007 election, as you have said, Howard dusted off that work, got Shergold sure in action, uh, and it actually had a policy for a cap and trade scheme before the 2007 election. So both sides had policies for emissions trading. Okay, so, the, so now just to, let, let's be... And the US was similarly working yes. on caps and yeah. trade. But, but, but I think it's important again to have everyone on the same page here. Can you, can you tell us in simple terms what the core elements of these national proposals were. What is an emissions trading scheme? How does it work? Why is it desirable? You know, we hear about different things. We hear about targets. We hear about emissions trading. We hear about carbon taxes. What? Well, from you, there's from lots of different varieties. But basically, let's make it simple and say we're looking at the major emitters because, you know, the reality is it's the major emitters on power stations. So it will make the big difference in Australia as the brown coal power stations in Victoria. So you cap them, you legally cap their emissions, uh, and they can either then uh, uh, close down or take out some of their capacity to achieve it, uh, or they may pay a huge amount of money to introduce new technologies to reduce their emissions, um, or Alternatively, within the design of the scheme, you give them the chance to buy the permits under the cap. So the key thing is the cap. You can and the permit is to you can separate. separate more and you just pay a price for it. That's an emissions trade. Yeah, I think you've got to, well, I think you've got to separate the cap 
Australia. I think that's what people get confused about. You, uh, you legislate a cap. So you put Which can be up here or down here. Yeah. Yeah. But usually countries that have legislated the caps, if you look at the European experience, they're the most advanced, is they allow for trading of that hunger. So that, so that if somebody who can achieve their abatements cheaply, for one reason or another, will have a surplus which you can sell to, work to somebody else. So you get, so let me just explain this. So do we have, you've got two power plants. Power plant A figures out how to reduce its emissions and it's got some emissions left, which it now can make money from by selling to power station B that couldn't reduce its emissions. And so that's why there's a market um, it's why people call the emissions trading scheme a market-based solution. Yeah. It was, it's, the concept was similar to the outcome in Kyoto. The Europeans were opposed to the flexibility mechanisms, but the flexibility mechanisms, mechanisms including trading between countries, was accepted. And the concept is to achieve the cap, in that instance the Kyoto cap, mm -hmm. at lowest Okay, now what's the difference between that and a carbon tax? A carbon, carbon tax is simply a tax on carbon, carbon emissions. And the, uh, both schemes make the cost of carbon more expensive. Mm -hmm. The advantage of a cap is often set. You know where, what your outcome will be because you've set, legally set the cap. The tax, you don't know, you know what the cost is. But you don't necessarily know what the current outcome will be because people may simply pay the tax and not use less mm -hmm. electricity. But in either instance, the, the real what, what is, is designed to influence behaviour is that the price of energy goes up, the price of carbon. Okay, up. good. So let's let's move to Copenhagen now. Um, but I want to do uh, the Australian and American politics in the context of Copenhagen. So ultimately. Neither Australia nor the US passed its own emissions trading scheme. And the intervening event, the one that seemed to tip everything over, was the perceived failure of Copenhagen. So I want to ask you about Copenhagen in a second. But why was the Rudd government unable to pass its legislation? And why in the US did the Waxman-Markey bill not get translated into something on the healthcare or financial reform model that the Senate could pass and become American law. Was it all about Copenhagen or was it about domestic politics? Um, it, that was all about domestic politics in both, in both instances. Basically in Australia, uh, when both sides were supporting an ETS, um, there wasn't much challenge. But as it got closer and closer to a vote, uh, because of the complexity, you know, what, what, are the, what are the problems with the ETS? The, because straight ETS is a simple thing, but when you start thinking about who we've got to compensate and what are we going to allow here, and extractive industries and trade affected industries and the public, uh, it can get enormously complicated. Uh, and, uh, where both sides were supporting it, that didn't really matter because you had the votes. But when one side decided to withdrew its support, you didn't have the votes, you didn't have a public. You had a public who was supporting the action on climate change, as Mr. Rudd ultimately found out, um, but wasn't necessarily supportive of that model because when they were forced to think about it, they didn't understand Okay, so was it, a, was it a failure of communication or was it the effectiveness of the Tony Abbott slogan, a great new a great big new tax on everything. And it was both. It was, uh, uh, I've said it, I've, I've said it publicly, which um, upset Mr. Rudd. I think he made a tactical error in not, uh, not seeking to sell his, uh, his plan to the public in relying on the politics, which you can understand if you had both sides, if you had the coalition and the Labour Party both got the same policies to the electorate supporting you don't know, really think you have to sell it. So you know, that was fair. Uh, but once you tell the Australian people that they're getting a great new car and a great new tax, and if they don't understand it, they're more likely to accept the argument that they are getting a great new tax. 
Uh, now, what happened in the U.S., of course, um, was that the, the wax, this Waxman-Markey bill died. One reason for that in America was that the oil price went from $150 a barrel to $50 a barrel. So, crisis, what crisis, Americans didn't, think, didn't seem to think they needed to act anymore. And the global financial crisis had hit, so unemployment was going up. But neither of those things would have affected the debate in Australia so much. Australia's an energy exporter, not importer. And as we now know, there was no recession in Australia. So you think it would have been easier to do this in Australia than in the US in 2009? Well, as I said, I think that uh, uh, you know, in, le in, legal, in legal terms, it's not a new tax, but the consequence in terms of the price of energy going up is the same. That's what it's designed to do. So, so the Daily Telegraph is now running its electricity price ometer or whatever they're calling it. And, uh, this is just yeah, but that's, that's a bit unfair as well because people say you don't have these responses to climate change because look, your price of energy is soaring, but it's soaring for other reasons. Mm -hmm. It's soaring because the infrastructure is outdated and has to be replaced and all the other reasons. We haven't got any ETS in price of energy still mm -hmm. going. Is still going but Australia didn't worry about the oil price and it didn't have a recession in 2009 and still it couldn't be passed here. And you think that's because once the bipartisan consensus broke down, it was just going to be too hard? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Copenhagen. Was the Copenhagen summit glass half full or half empty? The half empty version says no globally binding deal. All the countries did was basically come with their best national policies and all Copenhagen is is a, a big ribbon tied around the existing national commitments. The glass half full says no. There's really something important that happened at Copenhagen, which is that the developing world by China came in for the first time and tied themselves to the mast of reductions. Now the Chinese reduction, of course, is not an emissions reduction, it's an emissions intensity of production reduction. So I, I looked at this uh, just again to get the language correct. The Chinese government committed to reducing by 40% from its 2005 levels the greenhouse emissions intensity of production by 2020. So which view of Copenhagen is correct? The glass half full or the glass half empty? Well, I think the, the the failure of Copenhagen was to build unrealistic expectations in the lead up to it. And I, I thought in Bali when they said they were going to negotiate a global agreement uh, with legally binding targets, they were well, good land. And two years later, there was still this expectation that it could be achieved. And then when it wasn't achieved, there was a great feeling of, uh, of letdown. So, um, I think that's, that set the, uh, the sort of the, the, the visuals for, for Copenhagen and, and that was a bit unfortunate. But if you accept that getting to a new global treaty was too much to ask, then you assess what did come out of Copenhagen and certainly there were some positives that you mentioned. It was the fact that the developing world, the big developing country leaders for the first time were voluntarily committing to energy intensity improvements energy efficiency improvements. Uh, secondly, there was an acceptance that, uh, uh, that uh, adaptation in particular to the consequences of climate change across the developing world was going to cost a lot of money and that only the developed world really had the capacity to pay for it. So there was a willingness to put up $30 billion uh, by uh, 2012 and then $100 billion a year thereafter to pay the developing world to meet the consequences of climate, uh, climate change, which was um, a positive. And thirdly, I think you can argue, if you don't believe we're going to get to a world, a global agreement, this one's just too hard, Kyoto is hard enough, uh, then it did provide a formula for an alternative way, which is that everybody puts down what their best effort what their best bid is going to be on a voluntary basis and you have a process of peer pressure, peer pressure to try and hold them to what they've said they'll be able to achieve. 
And in the post, uh, uh, the atmospherics weren't too good on the last day or two, in the post Copenhagen environment, uh, most countries have now signed up to that formula that represents, I think, over 85% of global, global emissions. So there is the potential of another way forward. Right, and so let's just underscore that. Uh, a whole bunch of countries now have committed to national targets. They're not the same targets, but they've committed to national targets. Uh, they're not enforceable by a treaty, but there is moral pressure uh, in virtue of the fact that countries have said this in a multilateral environment. Before we move on post Copenhagen, you were there. Um, the, you, you just uh, averred to the uh, the atmospherics of Copenhagen. Um, I just wanted to ask you about a few things having to do with it. People say it was chaotic, the worst organized uh, international event in, in history. Do you think that's fair? Uh, Kevin Rudd lost his temper at the Chinese, apparently, big four-letter invectives all over the place. There are other rumors that uh, the Chinese held a meeting and excluded Obama. What was really going on in the negotiations? Well, I think all of those are true. <laughs> um, I think it's true that the rest of the world to but um, because he did have the answer, I'm not sure what the answer was. But, uh, the, uh, they, they issued um, 30,000 invitations for a ball that takes 15,000, and they shoot that 15,000 would turn up 30,000 bids. So it, it was freezing cold, so the other 15,000 were standing. Yeah, it's not so good in Copenhagen in August. And then when they get then when they get cranky, the Danish police lose their patience and wait for the sticks. And it was what the British are. But what about the intergovernmental part? Do you think the intergovernmental part was less convivial than in the past? More convivial? Well, that, it's got harder and harder because the other fifteen thousand were inside the, the room, and you you were trying to have a negotiating. National negotiating process taking place with 15,000 people pushing and pulling and pouring. So it, it wasn't conducive to reaching a freedom. Uh, and um, and I well, never got rich in the freedom anyway. But then the Chinese, um, the Chinese were uncomfortable because they felt they were being put on the spot. The pressure were not used to changing their negotiating. Uh, position in the last minute of a conference like that. Remember, that's not the way they work. And they felt they were being pressured, and that's when they became uncomfortable by fronting to Obama and some more junior officials who were on the side of the climate meetings, which upset Obama. Uh, so he was only there for about 12 hours. But um, uh, although he could fly home and said, I've achieved the Copenhagen Accord, this is the new way. Forward. And furthermore, furthermore, there's nothing there that I have to take to the Senate. No, so because it's already would have been agreed to in the US. If it was agreed, there's an agreement in, mm -hmm. in uh, and then you would have got a problem of having to present something to the Senate, uh, and, and which wouldn't have got through. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons he actually got the best outcome that he could have possibly got, I don't know whether his political acumen has been properly appreciated in that regard. Australia, on the other hand, rather held out that we could achieve a lot more than we could, so he then had to come home and try and explain why, why he did it. So, so um, uh, it was a shambles, and it wasn't a pretty sight, and, uh, but, but I would argue that there was, in the Copenhagen Accord, nevertheless identified a way forward, and if the focus had been, is now on that, there's a chance of making it through. Okay, good. Um, let's move to the future now. Three questions uh, about the future. One about China, one about international, one about uh, Australia and the US. China question. Uh, Tom Friedman in the New York Times has taken to the view now that China is going to lead the world on climate change because the Chinese think two things. One, they don't want to pay for high-priced oil and gas, and the higher their demand goes, the more um, they're going to have to pay. And second, they want to lead the world on alternative technologies because that's going to make them a lot of money in the 21st century. 
Uh, is China, is, has China changed its views in a fundamental way, and is that going to have global ramifications? That's my first future question. Uh, China, uh, well, if you look at the stimulus money, every, everyone put a portion of their stimulus money into green growth. And China put a higher percentage than anyone else. In fact, a large stimulus package, and they put a lot of it into green growth. And by that, they meant putting it into energy efficiency, alternative energy, which was nuclear and renewable energies. Why did they do it? Uh, I guess if you go back to Copenhagen, for the first time, they had been committing to improving their energy efficiency, and I think it's for a combination of reasons. It's one is uh, uh, it can save money, which they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it, it can take some pressure off, off, uh, off the demand of energy, so that's the energy security issue, cost and security. Thirdly, it has the incidental benefit of perhaps improving air quality, mm -hmm. which is a big issue. China in Beijing. And fourthly, I think that they did recognise there's going to be a huge global industry, particularly in renewable energies, uh, and they would direct money to that field and basically capture the uh, industrial potential. So that's a, the ultimate irony. China leads the world to climate change, not because it cares about climate change, but because of, because of a whole bunch of other reasons. It may care about it, but it doesn't need to care about climate change for any of those other things to be very Okay, second question. Uh, there's another global summit coming up uh, in Cancun, Mexico at the end of the year. Uh, any prospects for anything major to happen there? What's going to be the future of these big international negotiations on climate change? Uh, there's no prospect for any um, major. And, uh, next, year, the, next year's COP is in South Africa, and I don't think there's any prospect for Okay, so what's the next? Is there any event like a re-election of Obama in 2012 that could change the dynamics, or are these big multilateral negotiations dead and buried now? Well, at the time of uh, Copenhagen, which wasn't long ago, less than 12 months ago, there was a lot more happening domestically uh, than is happening now. There was prospects in Australia for ETS prospects in the, in the US. Uh, Japan is still, uh, well, it's introduced a capital trade on the municipality of Tokyo, but it's, it was introducing legislation into the diet for emissions trading. Uh, Korea was committed to the combination of hybrid emissions trading scheme and a carbon tax. So you get the big emitters through the ETS and get the, the masses through the carbon tax. Chile was, Mexico was. It, was it, it looked as if you're actually going to get global process without having a global agreement, without there needing to be a global agreement. Now, a lot of those initiatives have gone by the way, at least they've been suspended for the time being. Uh, if they are reinstated, uh, if you start building momentum from the bottom up rather than the top down, you may get sort of momentum then towards some form of uh, global outcome, but I'm not sure. Okay, so the last question then is about the domestic. The, then the last question is about the domestic momentum in Australia and the U.S. Um, you know, we, we now have a Gillard government that seems to change its views on on uh, climate change and what to do about it pretty frequently. We had a citizens assembly. Now we've got a whole bunch of panels. We've got an agreement with the Greens that may or may not include reviving an emissions trading scheme. Uh, in the U.S., the proposals seem to have died in Congress, but Obama is saying that he's going to prosecute a climate change agenda through the executive branch using the EPA. What do you think is going to happen in Australia, let's say, for the terms of the current governments? The, the current Gillard government and Obama between now and 2012, any action in either country? Um, a lot of process. Uh, I don't think, uh, at the national level, I don't think much out. In the U.S., there's more happening in the U.S. at a, a local and regional level. You do have regional uh, ETSs. You do have uh, California in the New Year. We'll, have, uh, we'll be trading with the Amazon. Unless the, unless the uh, 
referendum initiative passed in California that says all climate change policy should be suspended, shall be suspended, until California unemployment goes from its current 13% to 5.5%. Yeah. That's right. But I'm just... You're assuming that one will fail. Well, if between now and then, which is not far away, policies change, then obviously the consequences change. But as it happened, as, as we are at the moment, they will have a binding uh, obligation and they'll be allowed limited, uh, limited trade internationally. So you don't have to respond uh, to anything that's a fair assessment, on, but based on everything you said, it sounds like uh, despite the fact that Copenhagen was so uh, vilified, uh, it might be the high watermark for international action on climate change for quite a while. I think in terms of, of global uh, treaties, if you, if you like legally binding agreements, Hard water mark is going to be Kyoto. But it doesn't really matter much because all this is simply a process that's designed to try and lead to a conclusion, and that is to reduce the uh, rate of greenhouse gas, gases globally. Uh, and it's designed to try and facilitate that objective. There are other ways of doing it. And I've said that although at a national level I think it's struggling in Australia, and at a national level I think it's struggling in the US. There are other ways that uh, other things that can happen now. Uh, Australia did last year, this was at a national level, increase the renewable energy target, legally binding target for acquisition of renewable energy. And I introduced that first legislation back in about 1997, somewhere around about there. And the target we accepted then, which was supposed to destroy the Australian economy, was 2%. The target that is now legally in place in Australia is 20%. Mm -hmm. So that does lead to change. And energy efficiency is going to happen. Energy, energy efficiency is well, an enormous scope of energy efficiency. And that is happening in both Australia and the US and elsewhere. But the, the big picture solutions I can describe at the moment are struggling with the foreseeable future. Okay, that's all I have. Um, I'm sure there are questions from. The audience is going to be Mike Monitor today. Tom, you're the man. Do you want to go and identify a, uh, some questions for Robert? Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I don't know, my question is not in relation to climate change, so. Uh... Oh, then you're not going to ask a war question, are you? Well, maybe. I thought, given the, the debate in Parliament today, I thought it was relevant. Um, when you oversaw the deployment of troops to Afghanistan... I think Tom probably set this question up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think we'd ever see the day, almost 10 years later, when there's probably going to be Taliban ministers in a government that we live behind there? No, I didn't. <laughs> but... Um, I think, uh, do you want to know what the climate change ones first, or are we getting the war or the stories? Well, I don't know, you, you, it's up to you, you're, you're the boss. <laughs> uh, is there anything on climate change, or would you? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we'll hold, we'll hold that game stand maybe for a Yeah, no, I will, I'm, I'm happy to answer it, but I'll just, just... Um, I just want to ask... Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the government which you were a part of commissioned the UMBRA um, report in 2006, nuclear energy. Um, do you think that nuclear energy has a future, a place in Australia's future energy production? Um, if so, why? And if not, why not? Uh, nuclear energy is good, good for climate, but it's uh, also expensive. The problem in Australia, why it's never been seriously addressed in Australia, is that we have a much cheaper, easier alternative. It's still that. If the price of carbon rises to a certain level, then I think people will look at nuclear more seriously, but it has to, it has to rise considerably in the Australian context. Because we have to build up a nuclear industry and water regulatory apparatus and, uh, to, to establish Australia's first commercial nuclear power station would be obviously expensive undertaking. But what about uh, Australia's uranium exports? Um, Australia doesn't export uranium to India 
uh, even though the US will share civilian uh, te nuclear technology with India, and even though India's emissions, dirty emissions, are slated to increase dramatically, should Australia reconsider its decision about to whom to export uranium? Well, the, yeah, that's a, uh, that's not just a climate change question, so it's a strategic policy question. I, it really gets down to how important do you think the non-proliferation treaty is in today's world? And, uh, Which India has not signed. Uh, it does not, is not a signatory to, has not ratified, but the United States yeah, had its own... This is, the problem. this is the problem that uh, under the treaty, uh, we can't uh, sell to a party who's not a member of the NPT, but you can't sell to India, but you can sell to China even but it's a nuclear fact. It's under the NPT with a nuclear power. Most people, I don't want to get into a debate on this, but most people would say China has been less demanding on non proliferation than India. That India has got a, had a better record in non proliferation than China. Yet, because of the technicality, we can't sell to India. So, if you ask me, I would sell to India. Next question. Um, hi. Hi. In your opinion, uh, has the healthiness of the Australian dollar and the security of our lifestyle made the Australian public more likely to support action on climate change? Given more, that, sorry? More likely, more likely to support action. action on climate change, uh, given that in contrast, we are not plagued by many major university problems like the US, and which are therefore more likely to focus on these problems rather than the international issue of climate change. So the, the question is, uh, the economy is doing pretty well in Australia. Does that make it more likely that domestic action will on climate change will happen here than in the US where the economy is hurting badly? I certainly think in the case of the US, the, the, the continuing economic difficulty is making it harder for Obama. It's in effect abandoned at least uh, attempts in the near term to get legislation with federal, federal Except the more stimulus for green collar jobs and the like. That's yeah, the only yeah. possibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whereas in Australia they are still more persevering with and ETS. And I do think that when people are better off they more like they feel more comfortable about accepting an extra cost for that if they are not. But I think it's marginal to the whole debate as to whether Australia will or the US will uh, respond. I think we are the this. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering what do you think of the criticisms of putting a price on carbon with regards to increasing inequality, um, both in terms, of, in terms of domestically and for developing countries? Well, that's the, that's the, um, that's the whole debate, isn't it? That, um, that's how, why the framework convention was structured in the way it was and why we put a legal obligation on developed countries, uh, countries first. Um, but it is, uh, you've got to take into account uh, equity in this, in this debate. And that's uh, a common to, but differentiated measures was the language used in the in the game, which basically means measures that you can afford. So you can look at it internationally, or look at it nat nationally, or you can look at it uh, look at it locally. So whether you're introducing an ETS or whether you're introducing a carbon tax, there will be measures of offset to to help uh, relieve the burden on those who are less able to, to pay. But they also add to the complexity. So in the inter at the international level, that means lower targets later or something like that. Domestically, would it make sense to say something like, listen, we're going to cap electricity prices because they have an enormous impact on regular people, or we're going to uh, cap petrol prices, and what we'll do is we'll just we'll impose a burden on the firms and not allow them to pass the price rises on to consumers? Is that at all vi a viable way forward? Uh, well, it's, they're all viable in a, in a way, but they will all involve, you know, whether you introduce a carbon tax, but then you give um, you know, rebates to, to um, the less well-off, or whether you try to do it um, 
by putting a burden on the power producer. The consequences in the end of probably the same, it's just which, which methodology is easier politically. 